Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Stop the War Coalition's launch of the new NATO pamphlet. For those of you that haven't seen it, here it is in the flesh. My name is Shadia edwards Stashty, and I'm a National Officer of the Stop the War Coalition and I will be chairing tonight's meeting. So obviously the events of 2022 have really put NATO right in the spotlight, arguably more than any other period in the post-war era. Now, the war in Ukraine is absolutely ongoing. It's not only dragging out, but it's now at a stage where it's absolutely escalating. Just the other day, President of Ukraine, Zelensky, said and said that he is setting up a one million strong army. Then we're hearing from Russia that this is only the beginning and the worst is yet to come. Instead of calling for peaceful solutions, NATO is really just exacerbating this crisis, fanning the flames, sending more troops and putting more weapons uh, into the eastern flank. So make no mistake, NATO is not a defensive alliance. It's uh, absolutely a war alliance. If the summit just a few weeks ago was anything to go by, it's absolutely a war alliance. And it's not just the recent events that it exposes it as such. Of course, we only have to look uh, further back down the line in the roles of NATO in, in the areas of Yugoslavia, Libya, Afghanistan, just to name a few. So really, there's, those are the themes that we're talking about today, giving you just a glimpse of why we've launched this new NATO pamphlet. Uh, we have many chapters uh, in it, including the NATO's origins, the history and context of it, its drive towards nuclear uh, escalation and its failures in many of the regions. Now, Today we have for you two of its contributors, our pamphlet's contributors, Andrew Murray and Jenny Clegg. Um, they will expand on their chapters and uh, before I pass you over to them, I just want to use this opportunity to tell you that this uh, pamphlet, our new NATO pamphlet, is now on a special offer uh, for the next few hours. You can get it for just five pounds, but today, tonight only, we're giving you free postage and packaging. So if you haven't bought your copy yet, make sure you do so. Uh, Grace, my colleague, has just put it in uh, the chat there for you. So just follow that link, follow the steps and get your uh, NATO pamphlet with free postage and packaging. Um, it's only been out for 12 days and we've already sold 600 copies, which really goes to show just how uh, good it really is and how important it really is. So without further ado, I will introduce oh. our first speaker, our first contributor. It's Andrew Murray, who is the vice president of the Stop the War Coalition. He's uh, author of many things, uh, including the Imperial Controversy. Uh, and he's the contributor of the opening chapter of the situation in Ukraine. So over to you, Andrew. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Shadia. Um... As you were saying, uh, NATO is central to so much that is going on and going wrong in the world today. But we're in a situation where in conventional, in parliamentary politics, it's been removed as a topic for uh, discussion. Uh, questioning NATO and its role uh, is forbidden, not only in the Tory party, which has more or less always been the case, but now in the Labour Party under Keir Starmer. Uh, where uh, Labour MPs who might in the past have been speaking at a meeting like this uh, now cannot uh, uh, criticise NATO for fear of uh, losing the whip and hence losing their jobs. So uh, in publishing this pamphlet, we are Stop the War is sort of breaking a contemporary political taboo in actually shining a light on what NATO is and actually saying that here is an issue which it is vital uh, that people in this country uh, uh, discuss. Uh, it is indeed central to the war uh, in Ukraine, and I'll say more about that in just a second, but it's been central to so much uh, in the last 20 years, and you touched on it, Shadia, in your opening uh, remarks. Uh, it, it is a myth that NATO is a peaceful or defensive uh, alliance. This was argued during the Cold War, and during the Cold War, it is true that NATO as such didn't take part in any, uh, any military uh, action. The US did, and Britain did, of course, other NATO powers did, but not as a collective. Since then, that has changed radically. Uh, the uh, illegal uh, war against Yugoslavia in 1999 
Uh, that was uh, launched under uh, uh, NATO auspices, the attack uh, on Serbia, uh, with consequences that still reverberate to today. Uh, the 20-year uh, occupation of Afghanistan, uh, and we just saw uh, today the revelations about SAS soldiers murdering uh, Afghan people uh, in cold blood. It's the latest reminder of the horrors of that occupation. That was a NATO uh, operation. Uh, the war in Libya uh, in 2011, uh, that uh, too was done under NATO auspices. It destroyed Libya, leading to immense suffering and a refugee crisis that we live with to today. So it is false to say that NATO uh, is a defensive alliance, and those examples show how absurd it is to say that NATO cannot and must not be criticised. Uh, NATO was central to several of those calamities. It wasn't involved as such in the Iraq war, but of course its leading powers, the USA and Britain, uh, very much uh, were. So if we turn to the Ukraine uh, and what's uh, happened there, uh, we, stop, we stop the war have made it clear that Putin's invasion cannot be justified. We say that the Russian troops should withdraw uh, from Ukraine. Uh, but in the litany of Russian grievances, fear about NATO expansion is not an irrational one. If you look at that uh, uh, record uh, over the last 25 years or so, uh, if you look at the way promises given that NATO would not expand, promises given to the Soviet government at the end of the Cold War have been broken, uh, how it has relentlessly pushed forward uh, into Eastern Europe, uh, and how it is now escalating, uh, extending further in the Baltic region, uh, and uh, deploying more and more troops further and further east. So NATO's expansion and NATO's policy are at the heart of the Ukraine war, not as a justification for it, if you're clear about that, but as an explanation uh, as to why we have got uh, into this uh, situation. The idea NATO is a democratic alliance, that too uh, is false. Uh, we've just seen how Turkey, hardly a democracy at all now, uh, has tried to block uh, the uh, joining of uh, Finland and Sweden. Uh, it includes Hungary and Poland that are authoritarian countries, and indeed from the beginning in 1949, it included Portugal that was then a fascist uh, country. Nor is it even, despite its name, a North Atlantic organisation. Uh, it um, uh, ha uh, fought in Afghanistan, which is a very long way from the North Atlantic, uh, and it's presently the main NATO powers, USA, France and Britain are expanding in the Pacific, uh, as part of a confrontation with China. And that, I think, is something that Jenny, who's uh, an expert in that area particularly, will say uh, more, uh, uh, more about. So what is NATO? It is uh, an instrument, ultimately, of US power, or the power of the US uh, and its major uh, allies. Uh, it's designed to entrench uh, that power globally uh, at a time whereby many other metrics uh, the US is losing ground uh, uh, economically uh, and uh, diplomatically. Britain has been core to it uh, from uh, the beginning, and we are part of trying to prop up uh, by force, really, uh, a unipolar world uh, where only the voice uh, of the US really uh, counts. Uh, the dangers now of going along with this NATO policy uh, are uh, apparent. Uh, we are seeing the normalisation of the idea of nuclear war. It's been talked about quite uh, casually now, almost, as a possible uh, way that the Ukraine uh, conflict might escalate. We are certainly going to be paying for it. Uh, candidates to be the next Prime Minister are talking of defence spending going up from 2% of GDP to 3%. That would be an increase of uh, around £35-40 billion pounds a year spending uh, on uh, uh, on uh, the military. That will all come out of, uh, no doubt, other uh, much more useful areas uh, of state uh, um, uh, expenditure. It is dividing the world uh, into uh, blocks, uh, uh, armed blocks of confrontation. Uh, the policy of NATO is opposed by most of the countries around the world, uh, from China and India to South Africa to most of Latin America. Uh, they want nothing to do with this confrontation, but they will get dragged uh, into it. 
So we have to start talking uh, about uh, alternatives to NATO. First of all, uh, in Europe, uh, alternative uh, security arrangements that are not under the domination of any one power, but guarantee the security uh, of all. We need to talk about de-escalation, a reduction in weaponry, particularly nuclear weaponry, but also uh, the uh, extension of conventional uh, armed, uh, uh, armed forces. Uh, and we need to talk about how uh, international law can be made more binding on all, not just on uh, a chosen uh, few. But first of all, we need to assert the right to talk about NATO, to discuss it. Many of the points I've just made are covered in detail, greater detail in the uh, pamphlet, which I hope you'll all get if you haven't got it uh, already. But the pamphlet has only been be the start. We have to try and take its arguments and ideas into the mainstream of politics to break down, in particular, the Starmer veto on discussing foreign and defence uh, policy, uh, and indeed his witch hunt against Stop the War uh, uh, itself, which only serves the purpose uh, of preparing the ground for further wars and further conflicts, if we have a Starmer government going down the same benighted road uh, as, uh, as Tony Blair. So this is an important, indeed an essential uh, discussion, uh, and I'm glad that so many have turned out this evening uh, to take part in it. Thank you, Sheldy. Uh, you're muted, Shardy. Thank you, Andrew, uh, for your technical assistance and, of course, your uh, contribution kicking off our our launch tonight. Um, just before I pass uh, the floor over to Jenny, who is our next contributor, yes, uh, our pamphlet is on the website. Uh, apparently it's sold out, but Grace is just about to update that for us, so it should be fine in the next few minutes. Um, so our next speaker is Jenny Clegg. Uh, she is a national officer of the Stop the War Coalition. She's a China specialist and former senior lecturer of the Asia Pacific Studies. And she, of course, is a contributor in the pamphlet. So over to you, Jenny. Uh, thanks so much, Shadia. Um, you know, things are moving so fast um, that already the piece that I've contributed to the pamphlet uh, is getting out of date and really what I want to talk about is uh, the NATO summit itself because of course um, the summit has launched the world onto a new course of militarization and global confrontation um, not only escalating the proxy war in Ukraine elevating the militarization of Europe to an entirely new level but without any idea of the end game it turns the sights of the blunderbuss on China the new security concept mentions Russia as the most significant and direct threat 12 times, but it also mentions China nine times, setting the scene for a major escalation against China. And to underline the message of the summit, the US assembled the forces of 26 countries, including the UK, for possibly the largest military exercises ever in the Pacific off Hawaii. This was just the following day of the summit um, and actually NATO members and partners made up almost half of those involved and we might well ask what is an Atlantic alliance designed as we're told for the defense of Europe doing in the Pacific. China is America's issue, America's priority and Biden's backers have realized that the US is not strong enough now to tackle China on its own and it needs the support of its allies. The opportunity of Russia's invasion to bring US allies around the world together was too good to be true. As Biden and Blinken have made clear for the US, support for Ukraine is not just about European security, it's a part of an epic battle against so-called autocracy. With the Pacific Partners for Peace, that's Japan, South Korea, Australia and New Zealand also in attendance at the summit, it marks a watershed moment in the subordination of Europe to US wishes, the reassertion of US dominance and NATO's transformation into the militarized frontier of a new global Cold War. Those 300,000 forces on high alert across Europe are not only to keep Russia out, they sever Europe from Asia, lest, as Brzezinski warned some time ago, the two parts of Eurasia become the center of world power. Meanwhile, NATO is expanding into the Pacific. 
And why is this happening? Because as Andrew said, uh, you know, US is in decline and now China is rising. There's a massive uh, shift in world economic power. By 2030, within eight years, China is forecast to overtake the US in economic size. But it's not only that, India and Brazil are also rising and coordinating with Russia and South Africa, the BRICS could well eclipse the G7 by the end of the decade. So the US is fighting for its dominance, using the war in Ukraine to leverage its restoration as number one world power. And what we're seeing is a calculated game linking through Obama's Asian pivot back to the neocon project for a new American century. So the danger is now that with Europe and Asia linked under a single NATO frame, uh, that the instability and power struggles in the former will spill over into the latter, entangling the two together in a cycle of tension and conflict escalation. And when we look at the Asia Pacific region or the Indo-Pacific, as the Americans like to call it, to include India, uh, there are a host of long-standing flashpoints between China and Japan, Japan and Russia, the South China Sea, the India-China border dispute, a new flashpoint now in the South Pacific. All of these are manageable by dialogue and negotiation, but the danger is that any of these, as with the Donbass dispute, can be escalated into a full-blown war. The accident waiting to happen in the Pacific is Taiwan. As with Ukraine, the US is using Taiwan as a proxy to provoke China and to stoke tension so as to break and subordinate the Asia Pacific region as it has done Europe. Selling arms and training its troops, the US treats Taiwan virtually as an independent state. While Ukraine, of course, is independent, Taiwan is recognized by the UN and 99.5 of the world states as a part of China. Yet we're constantly drip fed in the, in the mainstream media the idea that China regards Taiwan as a renegade province. This is in preparation for the moment when the US finally abandons its one child policy and to stoke demands for Taiwan independence, which for China is the absolute red line. So we may talk about a new Cold War, but this is even more dangerous. Remember the first Cold War uh, in actual fact were, meant hot wars for Asia, the Korean War, the Vietnam War across Indochina. These were wars on China and the US at the time threatened to nuke both North Korea and China. 70 years on, these situations remain unfinished business. Today, NATO is all over the Pacific. The US and Canada, of course, Pacific powers. Uh, would you believe France and Britain also claim to be Pacific powers through ownership of New Caledonia and the Pitcairns, respectively. Um, so NATO members are there patrolling the seas, selling arms, investing in weapons production, cultivating diplomatic ties. The Pacific has become an alphabet soup of acronyms and new terms. The Indo-Pacific, the Quad, AUKUS, I'm not going to go into all of this because it's in the pamphlet. The point is that since it lacks the strength to confront China alone, the US has to find ways of inveigling Japan, South Korea, India into a wider military role. Most other countries in the region with China as their main trading partner don't want to choose between the two main powers. So the US has to move by stealth, creating new links into its hybrid warfare plans. AUKUS, of course, serves as the nucleus of an Asian NATO, and it was seen as necessary for the outside intervention of the US and, of course, the UK in order to push forward the region's militarization. Just a few, uh, just last week, in fact, AUKUS has set up the partners in the Blue Pacific, um, which covers the South Pacific, and it's a way of drawing Japan and South Korea uh, into AUKUS. Uh, Japan and Australia are both planning phenomenal increases in military spending and with Japan in the north and Australia's new military and nuclear submarines bases in the south, together they will create a maritime wall to contain China, matching the armed barrier across Eurasia. So the key thing in the new security concept, uh, concept is that it lumps Russia and China together to define a new era of strategic competition. And it's this that's seen to necessitate NATO's transformation into a global force. Now, as Stoltenberg, Stoltenberg argues, 
the Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific cannot be separated since what happens in one has consequences for the security of another. Ben Wallace put this most clearly when he called on the West to stand firm on Ukraine because China is watching. In other words, no negotiations, no concessions. Russia has to be stopped or it won't be possible to stop China. By the same token, Trust has hinted that the UK should, and I quote, make sure Taiwan can defend itself and we should learn the lessons of Ukraine where sending arms and training troops was left far too late. The Hawks of Great Britain have us out in the forefront of NATO's expansion in the Pacific as well as in Europe. I always remember that during the Vietnam War, President Johnson compared Britain to a troop of bagpipers. And here we are again amidst the swirls and the mists of gunfire and explosions, leading the charge, calling this way, this way. With NATO's new security co concept, we've turned the corner on the road to World War III. This is not just a new Cold War, it's more like a perpetual Cuban Missile Crisis. And we've missed the turning for the path of pragmatism where governments pull together to tackle the problems of climate change, of pandemics, of poverty and inequality. Instead, we're in for a decade at least of unprecedented turmoil, whether the war drags on in the Ukraine or not, with the threat of proxy wars are spreading along a single global front, as the US vows to drive Russia and China um, out of Africa, the Middle East and Latin America, um, an era of economic disruption and shortages, growing streams of refugees, the endless pumping up of military budgets, all because the UK, uh, America claims the exclusive right to shape the rules of the international order. And it's going to cost the cost of mobilizing resources, not only to militarize Europe, but also the Pacific. The cost of more expensive imports from the US bought out of loyalty whilst boycotting stuff from China. And the costs indeed to our democracy, as Andrews pointed out, where is the debate on the Ukraine war? Where is the debate on the nuclear dangers ahead? Where is the debate about US nuclear warheads returning to Lake and Heath? This is also a decade of the growing influence of the BRICS and the gap between global North and South in their perceptions of the future is increasing. The West is losing a grip on uh, reality. And I'll end with a quote from the author Martin Jacks who tweeted the other day, the West has its front to the past and it's back to the future. It's a prisoner of ways of thinking that belong to the past era of Western dominance, inhabiting a world that no longer exists. And how true is this? of Britain's elites. And this is the perceptions that stop the war has to turn around. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny, for that contribution, really stressing just how serious this crisis is and how NATO is expanding much further than we may think in this current situation and just how dangerous it really is. Uh, so now what we're going to do is open up uh, the discussion to the floor. Um, you can indicate that you would like to speak by just raising your hand, which I believe is just on the, the side of your screen. Um, and then whoever speaks, please just try and keep your contributions uh, to a maximum of two to three minutes, just so we can squeeze as many in as possible. So just raise your hand. Um, I have two contributions for now. So we'll start with you, Tom. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, I just want to focus on Lake and Heath uh, and the chances of discussion in Parliament, even though it's closing down in, in 10 days' time. Um, there was an what they call an early day motion, which uh, is dated the 24th of May. And it was this year, and it was about three days after our last demo, small demo at Lake and Heath got another one on September the 17th, trying to get more people to that. So please note that down. Um, my concern really is that this sort of uh, conspiracy of silence seems to be including uh, things like early day motions. So could somebody say how we can assist to get parliamentary discussion of things like early day motions, which for example, it, it it concludes this one that went out in, in May, uh, 
all to use all possible possible diplomatic events to de-escalate current nuclear tensions. Well, if they're not even talking about this in Parliament, not even considering the concept, I, I think we ought to put pressure on to try and get them to discuss it. Whoever comes back as, uh, as leader in, in September. Um, and the, the other point is that it seems as if people with a huge interest in defence, there must be at least a quarter of the candidates have an interest in, in defence. So I'm not looking forward very much to the new Tory leader. Um, take it away. I've finished. Um, but as I say, it's Lake and Heath that I'd like to raise at this meeting. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we'll take two more contributions, three more contributions before we go back to our speakers. Um, Paul, I saw your hand up next. Hi. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we oppose the Russian invasion of Ukraine and we oppose NATO's arming of the Ukrainians. That doesn't mean we don't support Ukraine or its right to self-determination. I, I find myself in this terrible bind about asking myself, well, is that just words or do, we actually, do I actually mean that I support Ukraine and Ukraine's independence? And I, I don't come up with an easy answer. And if we do support Ukraine's right to independence, then what form should it take now? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Richard, if you'd speak next. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I think there's a political issue here that's been hinted at uh, in the two uh, main speakers, and it's one which we cannot dodge, and that is um, that we have to link our opposition to the militarization with the political fight against austerity, um, against um, the squeeze on public spending, uh, which is all part of what the Tories uh, will, if they're allowed to do it, pursue uh, domestically. Um, I think Jenny hinted at that connection. I think it can't be dodged. Um, it's not possible uh, credibly, I think, for Stop the War to proceed as a single issue uh, campaigning organisation. So that's, that's my um, two pennies for what it's worth. Thanks very much. Right. Oh, uh, Ray, your hand is up next, but I can only see your ceiling. If you'd still like to speak, your time is now. There you are, but you are on mute. Yeah, I've moved. There we go. Moved. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to the speakers and Stop the War for printing the pamphlet. Um, I'm a long time opposer of NATO. But I just wanted to mention uh, today, because we've not put much emphasis on that, on the horrendous nuclear policies of NATO. Um, it, it, it's it, uh, always its strategy right from the beginning has included nuclear weapons and they call them a deterrent, which is ridiculous. And not only that, but as the uh, speakers have been saying, it's very costly because our, well, it's not our, US, anyway, Trident in Britain, nuclear weapons is integrated into NATO and it's going to cost which never mentioned public expenditure, it's going to cost us 205 billion pounds to replace, which is just crazy in this time of austerity when, you know, people are having difficulties in Britain, but across the world, you know, there's no longer poverty, etc. And we are spending that amount of money on a useless nuclear weapon. And they reinforced this in the recent concept that they would keep nuclear weapon strategy. And they also have kept, this is unbelievable, the policy of first strike. They would, NATO members would use the, the uh, weapons such as this, devastating. I mean, it would finish the world off if we use them first. I mean, they're out of their heads. And furthermore, NATO member states were prevented 
from joining in the UN negotiated treaty for the prevention of nuclear weapons. The majority world wants nuclear disarmament, but it's the leaders of nuclear armed states who are actually blocking that. They stopped them, dominated, of course, by, as everybody said, by the United States. They stopped them. Worse than that, they have this policy of nuclear sharing, which Tom has referred to. They want, they have five nuclear bases right across Europe to Turkey, imagine, with, armed with US nuclear weapons. And now they're going to have, bring Lake and Heath back. Lake and Heath was one, but it's now being brought back again in Britain. So we'll have nuclear bombs on our territory and we will resist. We will protest and I'm sure stop the war are joining as they were there with us um, uh, when we protested and we'll be there again as Tom said on September 17th. But the nuclear policies of NATO are a disaster for the world. They're not going to bring peace, they just bring more conflict and the US imagines that with that way it can dominate as Jenny said the world. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ray. I think this is a good chance to bring back in our speakers. Andrew, if you'd like to come back first, I can invite you in now. Uh, thanks, Shadia. Yes, well, just quickly on the points that were raised. I mean, Tom raised quite rightly the situation at Lake and Heath, uh, where we're seeing American nuclear weapons coming back uh, to Britain. Uh, in any normally functioning democracy, this would indeed be at least debated in Parliament or discussed. Uh, but there is, as he says, a conspiracy uh, of silence, uh, as there is around nearly all matters relating to foreign and defence policy now, and that is what we have to break down. Um, Paul raises the question of Ukrainian self-determination, and of course Ukraine, Ukrainians do have the right to self-determination, uh, same as any other people. Uh, my own personal view, and this isn't something Stop the Wars ever taken a collective view on, is but one of the other roots of the Ukraine war, apart from NATO expansion and the US, you know, drive eastwards, has been the problems that arose from the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Um, where we can see it's not just in Ukraine, there's a war between Armenia and Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh last year. Just very recently, there's been trouble in Karakalpak in Uzbekistan uh, as there was an attempt made to uh, end its autonomy. There's all sorts of problems that are left over. Uh, and in my personal view, Ukraine have a right to self-determination, but also people in the Russian-speaking East, if they wished, should have a, a possibility to decide whether they want to be in Ukraine, autonomous, independent, uh, or join Russia, if the democratic situation could be created for people's uh, voices to be made heard. Now, that's not possible right now. You've got masses of refugees and a, a war going on. But I do think, and in the end, the lasting settlement will have to at least address those uh, issues. I very much agree with what Richard's saying about the connection with austerity and economic policy. We're now got Tory uh, candidates outbidding each other to talk about the increase in military spending. And at the same time, huge tax, promising huge tax cuts, particularly on corporation tax. Well, we can all just work out that that, that, that the maths of that is only going to be made to work by cutting almost everything else uh, that the, you know, education and health and uh, welfare and uh, investment in infrastructure and so on. And stop the war, certainly very, I mean, our focus is on war. I mean, we do what we said it says on the tin, uh, but we always have campaigned with other organisations. We were on the TUC march uh, just recently, making the link between welfare uh, and warfare. So I very much agree with that. And of course, Ray uh, is right to raise the dangers of a nuclear, uh, the nuclear policy followed by NATO. One of the most dangerous things uh, of the present situation, as I said in my opening remarks, is how the idea of nuclear conflict is being sort of normalised again, probably for the first time since even the early 1950s. Uh, the idea is being sort of said, well, this could happen. People talk about it as if it wasn't the end of the world, when actually, literally, it is. Thank you, Andrew. And just before I invite you back, Jenny, just a reminder, everybody, you can get your pamphlet on our website with free postage and packaging. So make sure you do that today. 
Uh, Jenny, if you'd like to come back in, that would be great. Yes, thanks. I'll just um, follow through a, a few of the points um, on, on the nuclear question. Um, I think that, you know, Britain is um, absolutely fundamental, as Ray says, to NATO's uh, nuclear um, weapons position uh, next to the United States. And we can see how Britain's nuclear role in NATO is being developed. Um, we've talked about the um, return of US uh, warheads to Lakenheath. Actually, Lakenheath will become a European center for the training of uh, pilots of the F-35As, which carry, uh, which are capable of carrying nuclear warheads. And of course, uh, this will be a flexible base uh, giving backup um, across Europe. Secondly, uh, Britain is involved in the development of nuclear powered submarines um, over in Australia. And of course, in that part of the world, in the South Pacific and in South uh, East Asia, they both have um, uh, nuclear weapons free zones. Uh, so this is a violation. And in actual fact, in the South Pacific in the 1980s, this was a very strong assertion of their independence that they were saying no to nuclear. And then, of course, we have also had uh, visits uh, at Faslane of US uh, and French uh, nuclear submarines. Uh, and so, you know, it looks to me like they want to develop Faslane into a NATO nuclear base, which will have reach. Uh, into the high north and the arctic so i think that that we have to keep an eye on all of these um uh developments and britain is right at the center of the uh you know it's the heart at the heart of uh, nuclear nato um now i, th I think that uh, you know andrews um talked about um you know the the need to uh, return to and make international law uh binding um one of the things that, that strikes me um, looking at the issues from the Pacific is the way that they're touting this notion of the free, the free and open Indo-Pacific. Free and open Indo-Pacific, they keep repeating this over and over and over again. And so we think of things like the freedom of navigation uh, operations in the South China Sea and things like that. But what it occurs to me is, you know, when they talk about Ukraine, Ukraine has the right to join NATO. Ukraine has the right uh, it, to decide its alliances. Ukraine has the right to decide its uh, foreign policy. This is what they're shoving down our throats all the time, that this is some kind of a democratic right that countries have, that they can form a military alliances and so on and so forth with whoever they want. But it's not quite like that because uh, you can't, countries can't just do whatever they want. They can't go around polluting the planet. They can't go around uh, exporting uh, nuclear materials. Now they're trying to break that. But, you know, countries do have to think about their neighbours. Are they, you, you know, we all have to think about our neighbours. If we play loud music late at night, it's going to upset people. And do we want to go around upsetting people? It is, you know, the, the, the UN... Uh, you know, has these rules on uh, territorial integrity uh, and, uh, uh, you know, non-invasion and so on. But they also have a commitment to peacefully negotiate disputes. And it, that is what NATO hasn't done with Russia, as far as I could see. NATO doesn't, it doesn't abide by the UN. So, you know, it's, you know, it's all of these sides of uh, international law, territorial integrity, but also respect for other countries' uh, security concerns, resolving disputes peacefully by um, uh, uh, dialogue and negotiation. And viewed, you know, from Asia, the kind of things that I hear from Asian uh, scholars and commentators on this, you know, the Ukraine situation is simply that it just needed a little bit of pragmatism. It just needed a little bit of compromise on both sides. And this situation could have been 
uh, resolved. Uh, but the, but people just dug their heels in. And on the question of the links with the with the with the cost of living, and I'll just say a couple of things here. I mean, it seems to me now that with the disruption um, in oil and gas, in particular and uh, in, in food supplies, this is going to go on. And the world economy isn't in a good state anyway. Coming out of COVID, it was bad enough. Um, and this isn't just a blip that's going to be over soon. I, I, I think that these kinds of economic difficulties are going to persist and persist and persist. And I would just like to remind everyone, when we banned Huawei and we had to strip Huawei out of our systems, um, it cost, uh, and is costing at least a billion. Um, and there's going to be more of this. There's going to be more boycotts and bans and, uh, and more disruption and uh, more havoc uh, caused. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, Ray says they've lost their senses. They've completely lost their senses. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, if we can bring everyone back from the floor. Lindsay, you had your hand up for quite some time, so we'll start with you, please. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ardu, and thanks to Jenny and, and Andrew for, the, um, for their introductions and all the comments that they've made. I just wanted to make two points, really. The first was about the way in which NATO isn't just a military alliance, it's a very obvious political alliance and it intervenes very directly politically in particular states and um, we've seen this in a whole number of ways some of which people have, have described but I think the recent summit shows very very dramatically exactly how it's prepared to play very very irresponsibly in terms of politics. Um, Sweden and Finland being admitted to NATO was at the cost of doing a disgusting deal with um, with Erdogan over the Kurds, which will make the situation with the Kurds much worse than uh, it was before. And there are all sorts of examples of similar kind of behaviour. And, and so, and I feel that when we're looking at a, a very deeply crisis-ridden country as Britain is at the moment, and we're in the middle of this Tory leadership campaign, look at how the war and defense and all these issues are being used politically in certain ways. Johnson used the war in Ukraine as one of his reasons for hanging on to um, being prime minister and that uh, we couldn't do anything about him because of the war in Ukraine. Now, this is a major part of the uh, Tory leadership contest is going to be about how much you spend on defense, is going to be uh, two of the candidates have said today that if they're um, if they become prime minister, they will accept the view that the, the human rights abuses of the Uyghur in China, which I think are real human rights abuses, they will accept that they are genocide, which I think is a dangerous escalation of the, uh, of the situation there. So this is a very big issue for us, as well as the points that people have made about, um, about the cost of living crisis and how people are suffering. And partly the sanctions have backfired on the West in the sense that actually Russia has made money, um, has continued to make money out of the rising oil prices and gas prices and so on. Uh, whereas actually countries, particularly Germany, is gonna be extremely badly hit by the, um, by the inability to get energy in the coming winter. Um, but the, so therefore, the, the, the second point I want to make is kind of tied up with this, because when we talk about self-determination for Ukraine, I think countries do have the right, and I think Ukraine has the right to, um, to self-determination. I also think it has the right to defend itself against invasion, um, which is a right under international law, but I happen to think it's, it's absolutely right as well, and that Russia wasn't justified in invading. But you can't just see it in terms of this is a simple issue, because what is actually happening in Ukraine is it seems to me this war is going to go on for a long time now. Who are going to be the main sufferers as a result of this? It's going to be the people of Ukraine. That the NATO powers are, are pouring in more and more arms. This will lead to a longer and longer war. And the people who will suffer already have suffered, already are suffering. The people who are refugees, people who've been displaced, people who've been killed and injured in the, um, in the war. So 
I think we have to look at this and it's not just simply, you know, there's been various points where we said during the um, Yugoslav War in, in 1999, my view about the um, self-determination for the Albanians was it was a much more complicated question than just simply looking at it. And it was being used by NATO and used by uh, the United States and other countries in order to justify war. And our main argument surely has to be, we don't want, as somebody put in the chat, that war is the most terrible situation or one of the most terrible situations that people can find themselves in. We are heading towards more wars. We're heading towards the danger of nuclear war, as people have put out. Therefore, the really urgent question that we have to raise and which is not being discussed in British politics or most other countries at all, is the question of peace, of stopping this war and actually looking for peace. Now, I don't think many of us have illusions that, about Putin. I don't think many of us have illusions about most of the leaders, but at least this would mean an end to the wars. And then we have to start thinking, okay, what kind of society do we want? Do we want to continue with a militarized imperialist society, which is uh, leading to more and more wars as a result of economic competition, or do we want a different kind of system? And I think it raises many of these questions. And I think it's a question of great urgency that we uh, we can't, you know, this isn't just a kind of, uh, as I'm sure everybody's aware, it's not just a sort of abstract or academic discussion here. We're talking about very serious deterioration of the international situation in the last six months, and this is going to continue.